Hola, welcome back to AS. I'm your host, Brenda Hernandez Jaimes, and I want to thank you for taking the time every day to listening or watching another empowering conversation with a talented and inspiring Latina who is creating an impact in her life, career, and our communities. And for episode 48, I'm really excited to present our guest. She's a fellow communicator, so you know I'm over the moon to share her story and amplify her voice. Stephanie Castillo is a fourth-year PhD student in chemistry at Vanderbilt University. She started Future Doctors as both a creative outlet for her to share her passion for outreach and teaching, but also to bring diversity to the STEM workforce and academia through representation in media. Stephanie uses YouTube as a platform for outreach because it can be easily accessed and available for teachers to use in their classroom. She has interviewed her colleagues who are also minorities in their field and talk about their research. Stephanie also talks about her graduate school experience with full transparency, something that I love and connect with, to show both the highs and lows of the PhD process and navigating that space as a minority in STEM. Stephanie is also an award-winning video producer who is self-taught thanks to her addiction to YouTube. She has been awarded the first place for Little Silicon is a Big Deal, a 2,900 prize towards producing for Future Doctors from Wondery Pre-Launch Entrepreneur Program, Vanderbilt's Institute for Digital Learning Fellowship, and most recently has been accepted into the World Congress of Science and Factual Producers Emerging Producers Bursary Program. Please join me in welcoming Stephanie Castillo. Hola, Stephanie. Hola. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here and being so open and you know taking time of your day to being here on AGAS. I'm excited to have you. And I just want to go into this because I think you're a phenomenal woman who is just so honest and just you know, allowing us to be part of your journey, always letting us know where you are and how you're growing. Yeah. So I feel like I have no choice with social media. For some reason, it's just like an online diary that I just like write about myself and just forget that this is out for the public. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I always love to start this conversation with asking my guest, who is Stephanie? Oh. After, you know, learning all of that from you from the intro i want to know dig into who is stephanie who is that woman that is a loaded question (laughs) i'm still trying to figure it out um yeah i don't know i think i've grown well going into graduate school i think graduate school really pushed me out of my my bubble I, Uh i guess like my little security bubble i think um i used to do gymnastics growing up and so that taught me the discipline and the teamwork and you know just always needing needing to like always trying to like step my game up and be yeah. better but also like that didn't translate well in academia <laughs> I think I don't realize like how you know I'm, I'm really trying to learn how to not get defeated when I can't do something well or if I you know don't succeed the first time but I think from like falling so many times in gymnastics and like um, having these mental hurdles, I feel like I've always somehow learned how to overcome and trust in the people around me to to overcome that. So I think, yeah, I'm a little, I'm a little shy and timid, but I'm learning how to speak for myself and make space for myself in places that I that are not really there's not a table, you know, it's not a seat for me there, or you know, I'm not and I'm not welcomed ex- exactly. But yeah, learning learning how to use my voice and not be so shy. Um, and believe in myself. So I think that's where I am in my journey. No, and I think I love that you're the actionable step for you to believe in yourself and opening space for yourself in spaces that maybe you're not welcomed in is your current dissertation project, but also your business, which is Future Doctors. It's a space where, you know, you are not only like amplifying your passion and your love for science communication, but you're also helping other people who are minorities to also be empowered in their own voice and in their talent and their knowledge. So younger students in the future, like in high school, can be maybe inspired to take that same path as you because I know from Instagram that, you know, science 
STEM wasn't an industry that, you know, was on the top of the list, but, and, and I feel like in high school, it's a pivotal moment to hear and listen to these voices and, 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 these, and see these people, you know, in their field and being inspired that it's also possible to be in these spaces and take space and, you know, being proud of their voice. Can you share with me how that journey was of not believing science was the first option and then realizing in college with your, you know, first Latino science teacher that it was like, this is a possible reality for me and I'm ready to take that path. Yeah, I think, you know, as a first generation student, so like my family immigrated over to the States um, from Venezuela and I was only like, I was little, I was still a baby. I was only like a year old. And so I think like growing up, both my my sister and my brother went to community college, but they couldn't really, like my sister got married young. My brother was more into art, so he, they kind of not really finished, you know, for, went through with that. So I just knew like, okay, community college is the next thing, but I have no idea what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. I was pretty okay in school, but, you know, I, I never really thought, I never really knew exactly what I wanted to do. It's, it's like, okay, I did gymnastics, but I can't, like, I'm not that good to like go to the Olympics or anything. And then, um, you know, I wanted to be a veterinarian, but then a bird bit me and I was like, nope, I don't want to do that. (laughs) Okay. So what, like, what am I good at in the classes that I've taken so far? And it's like, okay, out of all the classes that I, that I took, I think chemistry was the one that I, like, I I wasn't in love with it. The teacher made it fun, but I think it was the one that I was like, okay, like this is, I'll just choose this. I'll just choose science and I'll just choose chemistry. Um, but I, yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't one of those kids. I was like, Oh, I knew exactly what I wanted to be when I grew up. I just kind of chose chemistry, um, and just decided and just knew I had to go to community college as my next step because my parents were just like, you're going to get an education. Mm -hmm. That's it. You know, you got to get, you know, you got to get, you got to, you know, be above us. You have to do better than what we do. Um, and so I went to community college and I just took like my intro math classes and I had to take chem- the college chemistry and I was so bad at it. Like I did, I got like an A in high school, but I was failing like almost all of my exams. So I was really forced to try. Like I didn't want to fail. So I was, I was forced to do better. So I had to go to the office hours. And so my, my chemistry, my uh, community college chemistry professor was a Hispanic woman. I think she was, I think she was either Puerto Rican or Mexican. I don't remember, but, um, But yeah, her name was Angelica. And so she, I don't know, I just got to know her a little bit more because I Mm -hmm. would like express of like feeling frustrated that I didn't really understand the problems right away. And she was just very nurturing with me and like really taking the time to explain things with me. And even though I like would mess around in the lab and try to act like I'm like, I was always like kid in the background that would like say stuff and the teachers would get so mad, but I'll say stuff to make the class laugh. So I was like, I was that kid that all the teachers hated. <laughs> so then, um, but then I like, you know, since I was trying to do better in that class, I kind of had to change my attitude and I had just more appreciation for the subject. Um, and coincidentally that year too, the movie Contagion came out and um, <laughs> ironically, <laughs> a pandemic. Yes. <laughs> um, and uh, Kate Winslet was the scientist in that movie coming up with the vaccine and she ended up like, and they just showed the whole process of how, you know, you went from the, the pig getting infected to when the Paltrow eating that pig and then all of a sudden infecting everybody else in the country. And then Kate Winslet and them like trying to develop this vaccine and she ended up injecting herself. And I was like, Ooh, this is what I want to do. Like, I want to be, I want to do this type of, I want to be in this type of field. So I was like, okay, I'm going to do biochemistry. So I just decided from then on to just like focus my, like to just dedicate my time to STEM mm-hmm. and continue on. And I went from community college to uh, University of Central Florida for my, and then I pursued biochemistry. Um, I feel like I'm rambling at this point. But, you are not rambling. <laughs> so yeah, I took biochemistry and then figured out that I sucked at it and I hated it. <laughs> A lot of memorization, which I didn't like. So I just stuck to, um, I just stuck to traditional chemistry until I took inorganic chemistry my senior year. And that was like Mm -hmm. the only subject that actually clicked for me. Like 
the like the te- whatever the teacher expressed, even though it was difficult, like I just understood it for some reason, it just made more sense to me. So I decided to um, continue on and do inorganic chemistry um, for graduate school and for my research. Yes, and then I love that media has been a part of your journey and realizing what you want, right? And currently yeah. what you're doing and studying for your PhD. And I want to go deeper because. So you realize, you know, you're doing your grad school and then later on your followers, your people that follow you know this, but our listeners, um, for them to get a bigger picture. So you decided after graduate school to do your PhD for four years in um, chemistry and then they said no. And (laughs) I... I've never done a PhD at yeah. the moment. I do not see myself doing a PhD, but yeah. I can imagine the pain, the frustration, those feelings of investing four years of your life mm-hmm. and finding something that you were good in and then deciding to f- continue following that path and then being mm-hmm. said no. At that moment in time, it must have felt very like and correct me if i am wrong but like the world was ending right and but also looking back it was the opportunity for your current situation which is science communication and i feel like something that you are amazing at right this is like your calling and can you share with me how that journey was of giving it your all and being said no to and then looking back and the lessons learned and how that has helped you being shaped in your current program and as a communicator in science. Yeah. Yeah. I think it wasn't, it wasn't so directly going into four years. I kind of like, I feel like my story is kind of like little branches that kind of like grew Mm -hmm. out, you know? So I started the chemistry PhD program Um, I was able to get into that program because I did a summer research internship at this university. I enjoyed the research that I did. Um, It was the only school that I got that I got accepted to when I applied. And so I was just like, okay, this is like meant to be, you know, I got I got into the program that I wanted and get to continue to do the research that I wanted. And so, um, however, I think where my journey begins was kind of like so in the university that I'm at, we do rotations. So I get mm-hmm. to I get to try three different labs before I decide which lab I want to join. Um, so once I joined that lab, I was excited, but I was given a project that was kind of outside the scope of what that lab specialized in. So I wasn't really, and the mentor that I had or my advisor was very like was very hands off, and I was I, I that was my like my expectation going into that, uh, that, uh, lab was that they're going to be more hands-on. Cause I kind of like, you know, the research that I did in my undergraduate, although it, I still had research experience and still had summer research experience, it's not, it was so different than like the level of research that you're doing as a graduate student. Yeah. And you have to, you're kind of just thrown into the, thrown into it and just expected to be independent right away. And I just kind of needed a little bit more like handholding, I guess. Um, and so I was given a project that was outside the scope of the research that the labs uh, focused on. And so I couldn't really get a lot of help. I didn't really, I was kind of lost. And, but instead of like speaking up and asking for mm-hmm. help, I felt shame that I didn't know what I was supposed to be doing. And so I was just kind of floundering along, not really making a lot of progress, um, not feeling motivated to do anything because I had no idea what I did do. And even if I did ask for help, it wasn't really it wasn't enough for me to feel confident to continue to do the project on my own. Mm-hmm. And so my advisor started to pick up on that. And um, so in grad in the, in the chemistry program, we have like two main, like two, three main exams, pretty much. We have our first one, which is what we do in our going into our second year. It's just to do as a preliminary exam, just to make sure like um, that you have a project and you're at least working on something and understand what you're doing. And then you have your qualifying exam. That's where you become a PhD candidate. And then you get to defend your thesis and become a doctor. So I was preparing for this first exam. 
And my advisor just kept telling me like, Hey, I'm concerned about you and concerned about your progress. But I'll be like, Oh no, okay, I'll work. I'll work. I'll work. But it wasn't really making progress because I still had no idea what I was doing. And it got to the point that, you know, I became anxious. I didn't want to, I was like avoiding my advisor again for feeling shameful and stuff like that. And it got to the point where like I finally had to confront the situation and I like went to my advisor's office and just like broke down. And I was like, you know, I really need help thinking through things. Like I kind of need help like figuring out what to do and expressing my, my expressing the need that I, or expressing my need. Uh, that's when I was told by mm -hmm. my first advisor that the way I spoke was more master's material than PhD material. And so that like, like, like shut me up at that point. I was just kind of like, okay. And I was like, well, it's like, I, I want to do my PhD, but mm -hmm. I just need a little bit more help. And so they ended up changing the project for me to be more aligned with something that I was more interested in, which was more aligned for what the lab specialized in two weeks before this exam. And so I ended up failing mm -hmm. that exam and having to retake it. And while this is happening, you know, this is like my going into the second year of graduate school. So we're still taking classes. I'm teaching. I was preparing for my wedding <laughs> um, and then, you know, having to navigate academia for the first time. And so it was just like, it was just like a lot. So, mm -hmm. you know, the following year, I like hit the ground running. I did, I did what I had to do, I ended up passing the exam. But even after passing the exam, my advisor was just like, you know, let's just stick with the master's to see how you do before we decide to, you know, to move mm -hmm. on with the PhD. And I was like, that's not what I came to grad school yeah. for. You know, like the main goal to go to grad school is to get my PhD. So if this person isn't like believing in me to want to do this, then, you know, this is not the lab for me. So I decided to switch labs. And so I wrote, I wrote my master thesis uh, just to write the research that I did in that lab and before switching to the new lab. And during that transition, you know, I was really sad. I was really bummed. I was depressed. Um, and so I just needed like a creative outlet. And, you know, like you kind of said in my introduction, I have like a YouTube addiction. <laughs> and so uh, there's just one moment where I was watching, a, um, I like to watch a lot of science YouTube and uh, I watched a lot of science YouTube for my undergraduate because uh, I had a friend that got me into it, but also I, I used YouTube as a way to like study for all mm -hmm. the classes that I was taking and learn about some of the science YouTubers that were on there that were making like educational, but entertaining things. And I um, ended up seeing a panel where they talked about that uh, most of the, most of the audience, most of the audiences for like the popular science YouTube videos out there are predominantly men, men that watch it, like college educated men that watch these YouTube channels. Mm -hmm. And even the women that do host these channels, most of their audiences are mostly men as well. And then if you, there's another video that, that one of the science, the women science, uh, YouTubers were making where they were like, you know, they noticed that there was a gender gap between the men that were making YouTube mm -hmm. channels the views that they get and the women that make the YouTube channels and the views that they get. But they're also, again, these are just like white men versus white women. There's like no people of color. There's no, uh, barely any like, um, sexual representation or, or ethnic re representation in this. And so it's like, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to start a YouTube channel. I want to like, uh, I want to like be a, a, be a person that can like change this, you know, to, to, to add more people into this space. And, um, you know, anyone can start a YouTube channel at this point. So I decided to just start, start brainstorming ideas of like what my YouTube channel will be. And that's where my brother helped me out. And we ended up coming up with the name future doctors. Um, and so you know, going back to my grad's life, I transitioned into a new life. But mm -hmm. as I transitioned about the new life, I started looking for opportunities where I can develop this idea that I had. I did develop the idea of future doctors. And um, I got, uh, I pitched to the digital learning studio at Vanderbilt about my idea. They gave me funding. They gave me resource, the camera resources. And so I was like, okay, I'm just going to make, I'm just going to copy what I see on science YouTube and just like make my own little version of that. So I made my first video, which was on quantum dots about the research that I did uh, the first two years of my, of my graduate program. And I like loved it and realized that, um, and then through another opportunity called ComSciCon that I got accepted to because I had a friend recommend me to it. Um, that's where I learned that science communication is like a field. 
-hmm. and that science YouTubers are technically science communicators. So I was like, okay, like I, I kind of like, I like this is where this is going. Cause again, um, kind of like what you were saying before, like media has always been a big part of my life. You know, I grew up watching the magic school bus and Bill Nye, the science guy. I'm just like a TV baby. I'm always consuming things. And so I was like, you know, like me, I'm just going to do this for fun because the, this, just, this made me happy compared to me being miserable in my, in my graduate program. Um, so the more I decided to invest in myself and invest into science communication and to really discover what it is and try to grow future doctors, the more that I wasn't doing my research <laughs> in my graduate school program. <laughs> and so I switched to this new lab. I was the only woman in this lab. Um, I was at the men, like my advisor was better, but still because of now technically I'm a third year, they were mm -hmm. still expecting me to have this independence to carry out my own research when it's like, I never even got the initial training that I needed in the first place because my yeah. first advisor didn't invest in me. So it was just kind of like, I was just kind of set up for failure pretty mm -hmm. much. And I was just kind of, you know, beating away at the clock and just taking advantage. And I'm still a student that has access to all these resources and just using that to develop future doctors and like, you know, my personal brand or whatever I wanted to do, um, you know, at the cost of my research. So when it came to the second exam, which is my qualifying exam to become a PhD candidate, um, you know, they failed me because I didn't have enough research to show for. And they were like upset that they were like, okay, you had two years in this new lab or like, you know, like 18 months or whatever, year and a half in this new lab and you haven't done anything for it. But you, we see that you, you're doing a lot for future doctors. So maybe like, you should, you know, maybe you're better off. Like they did, they, they, they not gaslit me, <laughs> but you know, they presented it in a way that like, obviously you're happier doing this. So maybe you mm -hmm. should just go that and not try to we're not telling you not to try again for your for your uh, chemistry degree but you know you know they also weren't like you know once they once you fail your exam they're supposed to give you like a document and mm -hmm. lay out exactly what you need to fix in order to retake it mm -hmm. and they didn't even bother doing that because they were like well obviously you know you oh. like communication mm -hmm. more so you know maybe you should just go do that with your master's and find a job and I was like, you know, don't make that decision for me, one. <laughs> but, you know, again, I was devastated. Like, I knew I knew I was going to fail because, again, I knew it wasn't making research progress. But it just still sucked that I, like, I just, yeah, the environment that I was in wasn't invested in me. I, I was in a toxic relationship situation. I was, like, having mental breakdowns, like, every single month crying, like, not wanting to go to work because I was just, like, I was just miserable. I was mm -hmm. honestly miserable. But again, like I'm stubborn. And like the reason I got into grad school is to get my PhD. So I'm going to leave grad school with my PhD. <laughs> and it might not be what they decide, but you know, I'm going to figure out a way. And so I was only presented two options to either retake the exam. Mm -hmm. I was only given a month to retake the exam and somehow come up with enough research to like convince them oh that God. I can still do, you know, to still be accepted into the program or to leave. Um, but I like had, you know, I cried for two days after I failed. And then the third day I was like, okay, let me figure out my options. And I talked to like, sit, like I talked to 12 people on I 12 different people to figure out like what I could do. And one of those convert, like the final conversation that I had was the Dean of the graduate school. And he was the one that presented me. It's like, Hey, you know, we actually have an internal program, an inter internal interdisciplinary program if you can come up with your own funding and come up with your own um, committee, you know, you can have, like, you can make shift your own PhD program and we can put, we can slide you into this program so you can continue on. Cause obviously, you know, our university really, our university is, you know, they want to see their students succeed. And obviously I told them everything that happened in the mm -hmm. chemistry department. They're like, obviously this environment, like this department wasn't yeah. for you. And so like, let's get you somewhere that you can, you can do what you want to do. So, um, so thankfully, because I was so invested in my science communication for future doctors, I essentially pitched future doctors as like my dissertation project to various different um, faculty members in the departments. And I was able to come up with my source of my funding and get my own committee and ended up uh, starting my own PhD program for science communication. Wow, that is a journey in itself. And my heart is breaking just to know 
again, there was no interest, investment, and support that was given to you. Mm-hmm. In pivotal moments in your academia and in your life, this I just don't understand. This isn't a game, you know. And to know that things like this are happening and might still be happening because, as you mentioned earlier, you know, there's spaces that where you're not welcomed and. I imagine you're not obviously the only one that is experiencing this. Mm-hmm. Luckily, in your case, you know you already had future doctors. You were building it up. You you were growing and learning, and you were presented with this opportunity to further it. And I just thinking that maybe other, you know, women or minorities may, might not have that mm-hmm. project that fulfills them and that passion. I am happy that you, you were fortunate enough to, to experiencing that and to, not experiencing that awful experience, but, yeah. you know, discovering future doctors. Mm-hmm. So walk us through those first years currently now um, in your PhD program. And obviously beforehand, you had the help of your brother, you know, building this up, your knowledge, your obsession with YouTube, mm-hmm. which I love that you're self-taught, you know, that's, that's a current reality and something that, you know, I also continue. That's it, it, YouTube is a great school. And, yeah. you know, how has, how have you noticed the differences in support and investment in you and future doctors, as well as with the voices that you're amplifying, right? And also, you refining your knowledge and skills, but most importantly, your voice and what you have to bring to the table and to the space of science yeah. communication. Yeah, so like, I think um, the idea that I had first was like, what was starting off with future doctors, I just kind of reached out to like my, like my, my friends and different pro- and programs that I've met through being, um, through like, you know, black and like the latinx or like first generation types of, of little pools from the graduate program but it was essentially my friends and colleagues were like oh my god steph this is a great idea like yes of course i'll help you be a part of it you know they let me interview them i took pictures of them um you know we met for lunch and that's where i would um talk about their research they'll send me any documents that they had any papers that they had and that's where you know although i didn't get like the best training in my chemistry program, Mm -hmm. like I'm still a part of the program and I'm still picking up the basic knowledge of like, okay, you know, how do I read a a literature, Mm -hmm. you know, an article, how do I break this down? How do I understand the experiment that they're doing? And how do I, how do I break this down in a way that that I can share this on my social media, you know? So I kind of just started off with just interviewing my friends and posting um, uh, like, a week, I will feature them for the week. And so from like Monday through Thursday, I'll talk about their science and all Friday, I'll reveal who the scientist was that I was, uh, that was behind the work. And then I'll feature their profile on a, um, like I just use Squarespace um, for my website. And so, yeah, I was able to get like, at least like, I, I think interviewed like 17 of my friends. And that's where I kind of started picking up. Um, and then I started doing, for the videos, I was only able to make two videos uh, cause again, like as I'm like, okay, I have some background in photography. Mm-hmm. So I like, you know, I knew how to handle the camera, but still I'm just kind of like filming whatever I just like, whatever format that I, I would think is good enough from like based off other YouTube YouTubers that I watched. But as I'm editing a video, I'm like literally watching a YouTube tutorial and then like doing the exact same thing <laughs> as I'm like editing it. And so, um, it took some time. But, uh, uh, but thankfully, because I, um, oh, how I further developed Future for Doctors, though, I really took advantage of, like, the Entrepreneurship Center at my mm-hmm. university. And so there was a program that taught you the basics, like, the introductions to, like, to developing your business model. And so you have to pitch them your idea, like, what would, what would be your business? And they will accept you into the program. And so uh, this... Um, this entrepreneurship center at Vanderbilt was called Wondery and I got accepted into this program and that's where I really learned like, okay, like, yeah, what does it mean to make a value proposition? What does it mean to make a mission statement? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, who is your customer? Cause I was like, okay, I wanted to grow. Like if I wanted to make, 
I know you I know you can make a living off of YouTube, but again, all of these popular YouTubers that are watching have already been on YouTube for 10 years. Yes. And because of having that platform, they're now they're growing and seeing the millions of dollars of millions of fault like viewers that they're getting and making millions of dollars. And so it's like, well, it's gonna be harder for me to do that now. And so like what what is another way that I can you know, make future doctors into something. I don't know what it will be, but into something. Mm -hmm. And so I was developed, learning how to develop my business model is where I kind of further developed, you know, okay, like I want to make video, like I narrow down, like I want to make videos for students. Like I didn't want to make it for other graduate students, but I wanted to make it for undergrad, uh, undergraduate students or high school students. And so you know, what, what does that look like? What, what would I be offering? Am I trying to make money off of this? Is this going to be like a nonprofit? Mm -hmm. And, um, it's still questions I'm still trying to figure out because yeah. it's, I'm a, it's a new space. Like even though science communication has been around, um, there, it's a, you know, this, it's, this is still a, to focus on representation and having, and focus on representation and like, um, you know, underrepresented people in STEM, like that's still a small little pool over the market that we have of just like co science content and science mm -hmm. media that's already out there. So um, it's, you know, it's been kind of hard to develop it, but I think the more that I believed in the statement, the more validation that I got from people believing in the mission that I wanted to do with future doctors and increasing representation and having this type of like media company or something to continue to, you know, again, like how you're doing, like amplifying different voices and, you know, bringing that to the people's screens, like, you know, the more opportunities were open for me. Um, and so I ended up uh, getting accepted to uh, this media lab, this Jackson Wild Media Lab that taught, it was like a 10 day intensive workshop where I like learned how to do like basic documentary skills. And that really like took my YouTube, my YouTube self-taught skills to like the next level. Um, and, and it really, it really changed my approach to what I, to what exactly what I, what I wanted to do, but also like opened my, my, opened my world to that, like, okay, I can actually be like a science producer, like a science video producer as like a legit job, not just like, not just be tied down to just having a YouTube channel and that's it. Like I can legit make a living doing this. And so I think that's where I kind of find myself now. So with my, um, I don't know if I'm off topic now. <laughs> you are not off topic. You are covering points that are very important that our listeners should listen and that we've been covering throughout these past episodes in Nia. So I love where you're going. Yeah. So, okay. So I'm, so tying back. So I'm pretty much carving out my own path to like what I need to do and what mm -hmm. I need, like what skills do I need to develop in order to be who I want to be. So once I, so I left the chemistry program and started this interdisciplinary program. The advisor that I have, he's the director of science communication department, but he's mostly, he was mostly advisor to undergraduate students. So, so I'm this, um, so like we're both just trying to figure it out as we're going, but he, what the vast, like the most, like the most thing or the biggest thing that has been so instrumental is that I actually have an advisor who is like so supportive of me and it's like night and day from like what I was experiencing like in the chemistry department where like, you know, like, yes, my new advisor is, is I have a lot of independence now because this is my own project. This is like, this is something that I started from the ground up, but you know, he is like, you know, do whatever you need to do. You know, help, like what, how do you need me to like help you stay on top of your work? you know, who, like, what do you need from me? And always constantly like validating me and making sure that like, Stephanie, like you are the expert in what you're doing and no one else is doing what you're doing. So like own that. And like, we're just here to like help you make it to the next, to the, to the finish line. And that's like something I never experienced from my previous program. And it just really made a difference because um, so, cause I failed my qualifying exam in the chemistry department, I had to do another qualifying exam for this new program and I was getting like P like technically not for sure, but like PTSD of mm -hmm. like, you know, like I, I, I already got screwed over by two advisors telling me, oh failed me for these exams and never really preparing me for these exams. So like, I don't want to go through that again. And so, yeah, so he was just like, you know, I would never let my students take an exam if they're not ready 
like he, uh, since I'm not part of a lab, it was just me and him. So even as I was preparing my, my uh, thesis proposal, he was a part of that process and will like review my papers. I also have a co-advisor that was very hands-on with, with helping me develop my idea and strengthening my, 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 my proposal and like really, so I can put the best foot forward for my committee. And, you know, again, he was like, I had, a, I had to push back my date two times because, you know, he again, he was like, you know, it's not that you're not ready. It's just like this document that you made is like not that well. <laughs> it's not well written. So, you know, like, we got to make this a little bit more polished before <laughs> putting that in there. Um, but yeah, but it's just like, you know, the, the, the support that he needed from the beginning and finally getting it. And so it's just really made a difference um, in my mental health and, and, and also in mm-hmm. like my, I still have imposter syndrome, but I, you know, I, I have a little bit more support in, in helping me continue to push through. Um, and so, yeah, so I am, so they're just like, whatever you need, you just got to do it. So I just kind of been um, spearheading, you know, taking opportunities that I need in order to, to get the skills that I want. And also um, what's also awesome about my program is that like um, my advisor is just kind of like, okay, what are like, what are the skills how can we write or how can you do a project that's going to make future doctors and your dissertation a portfolio for you? So when you graduate, you pretty much have something to show for, for like your future clients, you know, so they know, they understand and they believe and they understand, or they believe, they understand that my goal when I graduate with my PhD is to have future doctors be like my full-time thing. And so it's been really awesome to kind of like, have both my side hustle become my dissertation project, which will eventually be my future career. And so that's what I'm working towards. Oh my gosh, that is beautiful. beautiful. And I love, I I want to unpack because you just shared so many golden nuggets and advice that I think it's so necessary. First of all, not settling into, oh, the end goal is YouTube, right? Um, but also realizing, no, these science communicators have 10 years on YouTube. They have this experience and that's why they're earning this, mon- this money. They're earning these views. It's mm-hmm. not, like, not going to be an overnight success. Mm-hmm. You realize going into this, it's going to take time, support, mm-hmm. questioning yourself where you want to go. And making future doc- doctors evolve mm-hmm. so it can be perfect once you graduate and it could be it can become your business Mm -hmm. i think a lot of people a lot of listeners maybe and currently i feel our generation has been told this um lie you know being on youtube and you need x of followers and views and this is you'll be successful and if you don't obtain that you're not successful and seeing again through your Instagram, you've been open about, you know, throughout this journey of making future doctors evolve and refining it. You've taken pause on producing videos and you've shared that, you know, it's, it's, it's been hard. And I kind of want to pull that into the direction of in this current age that we're living in, if we're not producing if we're not showing on Instagram and social media, YouTube, we're not doing anything. We're not being productive. You know, that another lie that has been dismantled this year. Yeah. And I know that you're, that's something that, you know, you're going through. Yeah. Can you share with us how you remind yourself? Because it's not something that you overcome quickly, right? It's yeah. how do you manage to focus on the main goal of refining future doctors so it can be your business and evolving it and not letting that noise of you're not publishing on YouTube, you're not, you know, publishing on Instagram. So you must not be productive and successful. How do you manage that and go back to that main goal that is growing future doctors? Yeah, man, that's a, that's a hard, that's a, that's something I battle with constantly, especially because like, What's awesome about social media is how we're able to connect with a lot of like, um, you know, like, you know how you're saying like Lorena was the one that connected us and it's like I didn't even meet Lorena because of this other uh, 
uh, um, Prasha from Wonder Woman in STEM, she interviewed me and that's how I got to know about Lorena. And it's just like, you know, social media has been such a really huge community building resource for me and just uh, meeting other graduate students who, be, who started side hustles or started podcast or are doing awesome science communication on Instagram. But seeing all my friends and colleagues do all, you know, and seeing them growing and me just kind of like, I kind of just made two videos. I, I interviewed the first initial people and that I just kind of stopped there. Mm -hmm. But again, like I have to understand, like, you know, re, you know, reassuring that like the journey that I'm going through, no one else yeah. is like technically going through that. Like, yeah, I stopped making videos because I was failing out of my chemistry program. <laughs> so like, I'm not going to have the mental capacity to, to make videos. And also, like, I was doing a lot of um, student entrepreneurship competitions, and I was winning a few of them, but I kept getting I, the biggest, the biggest feedback that I kept getting was that they're, I'm not clearly communicating. And also, it doesn't seem like I clearly have an uh, refined, like, how I'm going to make my money off of, yeah. off of future doctors, you know, it's like, this is a wonderful mission and this is what you know it's awesome you're making science youtube but like if you're trying to make this into a business like how are you going to generate revenue and that's like still something i don't really understand so it's like you know so so i so i just have to really kind of figure out like okay like i can't compare my friends to i can't compare myself to my friends because one like no one has not no one but like I had the unique experience of dropping out of my chemistry of my, my chemistry program and having to redefine what I needed to do. Um, but now that I'm doing future doctors as my dissertation project, like, so the goal that I have now is that like, I want to make videos that I want to make sure that my audience are going to be engaged mm -hmm. and formed. And, and actually like, I can't measure how someone is inspired by it, but like, how do I, how do I make sure that like whoever is watching my video leaves with like some, some sense of, some sense of feeling that they related to my video or they can see themselves in the people that I'm representing in my videos. And so I'm really taking the time to like step back from making things and to, and to take the opportunity to really focus on my dissertation because before I focused on future doctors rather than my research and that failed. But now that I'm doing both and I, I want to graduate so I can move on, like I really have to focus on my, my dissertation. And so luckily the dissertation that I'm doing, I'm is half written and half a video portfolio. So essentially I'm, I'm still producing. I'm just not mm -hmm. showing it to the world and I'm just making sure that the content that I'm making is going to be, a, a well-researched representation of what my brand is going to be once I graduate. And so I just have to keep reminding myself because, man, there is just like, of course, with the coronavirus, there's a lot of like science communicators that like were able to grow their following because they were experts in this and, and communicating about the science or um, black and STEM, black and whatever was like a huge thing because, you know, um, of course, like all the police brutality that was going on and, and, and finally, you know, the world finally realized that like black people are freaking important and, you know, they have, you know, they've been an instrumental part of the, the growth of this nation. And so, you know, they were getting the highlight that they were, they were needing. And so, um, so, it should, you know, I was like happy to see my friends grow, but also seeing them grow and me, you know, being stuck to a feeling that I'm stuck to where I am. It, it's, it, it kind of, it kind of gets hard on my self-esteem, but again, I just have to know that like, I'm still working on it. You even are. though no one sees it because it's, it's, this is my dissertation, this is my portfolio. And I'm, I'm ensuring that like, I'm making sure that everything that I'm do is well thought out so that when I do graduate and do release and it's like, look what I got to show you guys, like, yes. blah, blah, blah. like <laughs> just, you know, show the world that like, you know, this is what I can contribute. This is the skill set that I have and I'm not someone to sleep on, you know? Yes. So I, you know, it's, it's a balance every day, especially with working from home with the, mm -hmm. with the coronavirus. It's like, you know, there's always moments that it just doesn't feel like you don't feel like you're always doing enough, but you know, it's just self-affirmations. <laughs> and thank you for being honest and recognizing that you are in your unique path, right? Your own path, not like anyone else's. And that you're building this foundation, making it stronger. When you graduate, you can hit the ground running and it won't tumble down. It won't be a 
a business that will might last for two years. Like you're building it to be strong Mm -hmm. so it can go on. And hopefully once you're no longer on this earth, it can continue like this. you're, You're putting in the work and that's something that we need to remind ourselves constantly. And I can connect to that because I'm also questioning, you know, where is it just going? How do I make revenue out of this? If I want this to be a legit media business Mm -hmm. and going back into the conversation, I feel like the imposter syndrome that you're going through not only has been fueled by seeing your friends, um, growth and success but also by the um, lack of investment in your talent and your knowledge Mm -hmm. and you know you've been open how in therapy you are not confident in yourself and you know your therapist calls you out and it's also in a work of progress and i think you know i just the the woman that I feature here is because I admire them and I love the work that you're doing. And I just want you to know that, you know, I know it's a, it's a, it's a struggle because I also suffer yeah. from imposter syndrome, but I just love what you do. You know, I, you, you are showing, you know, what you're working and again, share with us how have you been, managing and living with this imposter syndrome but also remembering that you know you have a lot to show your voice the unrepresented and uninvested voices that you also are you have been amplifying before and what can you say to our listeners who are also feeling maybe lost and uninvested by their surroundings and by the people that they might be next to yeah I don't know. Yeah, I think like talking to my therapist pretty much was just kind of like the the main thing where I'll just kind of be like, yeah, I just never felt good enough, I guess. Like if, you know, again, being told by like my first advisor, like even though this person, like the, the, my first advisor didn't, they, you know, their intention wasn't to hurt me. Like those words were super, like they really messed with my mind, you mm-hmm. know, it's just kind of like, and it's like not the first time that I've heard someone just be like, you know, maybe not like this is not not for you. Because I remember even as an undergraduate and doing some summer research programs, um, I was told, like, maybe this isn't for you. Maybe graduate school isn't for you. Maybe you should just be a technician. And um, but it's just like it's not. It's not that I'm not capable of it or not good enough. Is that like, yeah, I'm not in the environment that's gonna, that's invested in me and that believes in me and is actually going to put in the time to like train me. Cause that's Mm -hmm. like, I think that's the biggest thing that we get with graduate school. It's just like, you're technically like, even though you're still, you're working, like you're still a professional, like you're still, you're, you're technically supposed to be trained in the field that you're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. I think where academia kind of falls off is that like, it has to, it's very like, it has to be self, you have to be a self-starter and like not every a mentor advisor or not every advisor is a mentor. And, um, you know, so if I wasn't finding that in my current department, then who can I turn to? So I really had to look for outs. I had to look for people outside of my department mm-hmm. in order to find, um, support and, um, and, and help and guidance. And so, you know, I never took, um, or as an undergraduate, I don't know, or I guess because you went to, um, there's this thing called the McNair program. And the McNair program is for first generation, low income, um, underrepresented students Mm -hmm. during their undergraduate to get research experience and get and pretty much get help them get to graduate school. Um, And so being a part of those types of programs, you know, I was in a community that invested in me because and had the resources to like help me develop my skills. And that's like, and so I got, I think, I think I got used to that or accustomed to that in undergraduate that when I didn't have that in graduate school, I was like, okay, I'm going to have to make my own, like I'm going to have to figure it out on my own. So I really liked, um, yeah, I had, I looked for like online mentoring programs. Um, I looked for, um, um, they're like diversity directors from different programs across campus to like 
you know, um, to kind of be like people that can support me. Um, there was this engineering professor that got hired and he was finally the only Hispanic professor that I knew. So I like reached out to him during email. I was like, please, <laughs> you're the only Hispanic professor. Can I please meet you? <laughs> and so, um, so he wasn't, you know, he became like a, like a short term mentor for me. And so I really, I really had to find people and make my own community mm -hmm. um, because I wasn't getting what I needed in, in the department, the direct department that I was going. And so I think if I didn't do that, I, I would have dropped out like for sure. And just like, you know, left, left empty handed. But thankfully there, you know, there was some few um, faculty members that had my back that there was one faculty member who noticed that I was, uh, I was like not looking too hot one day. Mm -hmm. They're like, do you need a talk? And I was like, yes. <laughs> so like, so I told them everything that was happening with my first advisor and they were the ones that like recommended me like, yeah, you should switch lots. Like this yeah. is, that's not something that should happen. Um, I even went to professional development group for physics students because I was just looking for anybody and any kind of community that can like support me. Mm -hmm. And I ended up talking to the leader of this person and like letting them know everything that's happening too. And they were the ones that like also was just like, no, you need to, you need like, this is not right. You need, they validated my feelings. They validated that like, you know, your advisor is not being a good advisor. You need to switch out of that lab. So I really had to, I really had to one, not be afraid to kind of tell to yes. tell people what's up and not feel ashamed for feeling the, the things that I was feeling. And yes, finding people that like validated my experience that I wasn't going crazy um, or being too sensitive or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, um, and just, yeah, making my own community outside. Yeah. So when it, when it comes to my imposter syndrome, like, you know, it, from the back of my head every now and then I always feel I can hear the, you know, the sentiments of my first advisor or whatever, but just like, know that like, um, so yeah, it's just hard. It's like a lot of self-affirmations that I don't <laughs> practice, but I think, and I have to, I have to really work hard on not trying to get external validation, especially when it comes to like followers or like mm -hmm. the community that, that I built online. But it's also, it's like, no, Stephanie, like you have come a long way. And that's because yeah. of like my my grit and also like you know not willing to give up and also like you know like not yeah not taking no for an answer and it's because of my talents or the passion that I show for the work that I do that people believe in that and they believe in me and they see that and so like I am I am worthy <laughs> yeah but uh, yeah it's just it's hard it's hard it's still something I battle with every day of trying to not like yeah get validate like getting validation to know that I'm not crazy but also not trying to seek external validation mm -hmm. to validate my self-worth and um so yeah and it's a work of progress right it's a work in progress not only in terms of your career but personally and it's you know it's a it's a journey that's self-love it's it's going to continue to grow and something yes that i can definitely relate and it's just awful that you had to go through that experience to be able to surround yourself with people that are supportive and invested in you and i just hope for that the work that you are doing and as other latinas are doing that will not happen in the future and i want to go a little bit back again and i'm curious that i'm not curious i love that you were honest saying that in the in the before this workshop of science communication you were editing while watching the youtube something that i did while i was studying communication and yeah. you know i still do and it's i think it's totally valid and i love that yeah. and you know you have we've been talking about not being having that external validation but also i want to recognize you know the work that you've been doing the being honest to everybody on social media about your journey about your progress and those highs and lows has been able to connect with others in your industry. And you've been invited to, you know, talk in conferences and do your workshop. And you've also been honest in it wasn't all golden and sunshine, you know, in your first conference for speak, um, you were a speaker of her STEM story, correct? You know, in the end you cried. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. But that 
you know, I want you to share that story with us. Yeah. But, you know, you are growing, you are learning, you are refining, you know, your abilities to speak, to communicate, something that will be pivotal once you graduate and future doctors is a business because you'll have to, you know, do these things. And so share with us, you know, that journey of also being confident in yourself and what you have to give and also effectively communicating the message that you want to share to these people who are in these workshops and webinars because it's a journey, right? And so share with us those highs and those lows. Yeah, so yeah, um, because I was kind of like upfront or shared, you know, I shared my experience about failing my qualifying exam um, and even through switching labs. And I think that 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 kind of validated some a lot of other students who who were going through that, but it felt like they were like one of the few that yes. happened to. And so I normalized that and I think that's how I kind of grew a little bit more with my platform on future doctors. But I also started showing like, you know, those were my lows, but the highs that I would share is that like I, I you know, I took people with like my entrepreneurship journey of understanding like how do I develop future doctors. And so I was winning pitch competitions, which was really fun. And so, you know, Prasha from her stem story reached out to me and was like, you know, I love, you know, I love for you to like share, you know, be a part of this workshop. Like, what would you like to talk about? So I was like, oh, you know, like I want to share what I've learned through my entrepreneurship mm -hmm. and, you know, share that with, with the, with her audience. Um, and so I like made my PowerPoint presentation, but I forgot. And, and then last minute because of the, because, um, or last minute I got invited to, to be a part of um, a study about inclusive science communication at SACNIS, which is a conference for the Society of Advancing Chicanos and Native Americans in STEM. Um, so I got invited to go to Hawaii to be a part of the study. So that was like awesome. But I was like, oh my God, oh shoot, I'm like in a different time zone. <laughs> like, Prosh has heard STEM story. And then uh, for some reason, the, like the night before I was going to present, I decided to change my PowerPoint order. Like I had, I had, I was going to share my personal journey and what I went through and how I got into being an entrepreneur or whatever, and then share the things that I learned about my entrepreneurship. But then for some reason, I decided to change the order of it and try to like mix my story with the entrepreneurship lesson mm -hmm. and I just threw myself off. And so like, you know, how to wake up super early because of time difference and I was, you know, because I changed my PowerPoint slide last minute, like the flow of my presentation wasn't really that well. And so I was just stammering all over the place. I just wasn't really organized. And I just felt so embarrassed that I like legit cried at the end of the power, like at the end of the oh. thing. I was just, oh my God, I was so embarrassing. Just because I just got over, I just felt so disappointed and so embarrassed that I like, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, anytime I get overwhelmed, it just like instantly cry. And so, but like, thankfully, this is just like a conference with only women. So everyone's like, oh my God, no, you're fine. This is so great. Like, thanks for, you know, and for, you know, I, yeah, it was just, it sucked. <laughs> I don't know what to say other, other the same yeah. thing that it, it sucked because I just like, this is the first opportunity they got to present myself as a professional and hopefully as like some type of expert in what I'm doing. And I just fumbled the ball. I just dropped it, you know, and yeah, I just felt so bad about it that I just like cried just because I was so embarrassed. But Prasha's a beautiful person. And she was like, no, you did a wonderful. It was so great. Thank you for sharing your story. Like every time I talk about the fact that I was told, like, you know, I think I really, you know, Prasha really helped me validate that like my story has a lot of power. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, the fact that I went through the crap that I went through as my grad and then my, my journey and how I continue to persist through like that, that is powerful in and of itself. And that is like my superpower or like, you know, you know, I had some several women after the conference, like, no, thank you for sharing your story. Like I went through the same thing. This was like so validating. Like, thank you so much. So yeah, although it was embarrassing, it was still, at least I, I would did it. I draw like, you know, at least I was in an environment that was technically safe and mm -hmm. you know, was supportive of that. But I remember <laughs> after, <laughs> after the conference, I like had to go to the other conference. I had to go to like my in-person conference and I see uh, two of my mentors and, and these two Latina women's um, women that they're the ones that really, like they met, like they're, 
oh my god these women are so, i'll talk about them really quick but um i saw them in the hallway and i was just like i, I screwed up like my first workshop it's like mm, it's okay like the first workshop's always the worst like just forget about it like it's great it's behind you now like don't worry about it there's going to be plenty more in the future yes so you know it was nice to see that but yeah <laughs> it hurt my soul it hurt my ego for sure um for sure but you connected with your audience in a way i feel because so recently i talked with stephanie Aceves about the negative narrative of being the only latina going through this da, 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 right you sharing that experiencing and also being very emotional something that i am as well you know it connected with others and they saw themselves reflected so in a way you messed up but you also accomplished something that is so rare which is connection and like your, you know, two that these two Latina sciences, they said like it's your first one, you know. For you know, it's you're going to improve on the next one. And can you share those improvements with us and how you've been able to really be confident in being the science communicator that you are? Because I know that is a question that you know you ask yourself from time again, and it's there's not a concrete answer but you know it's it's the journey of evolving and discovering yourself and really at that time knowing the definition of it yeah i um yeah because i think like i so for me trying to figure out if i'm a science communicator or not because it's like i want to i really like being behind the scenes i really like being behind the camera i really like being on the computer editing these videos but i know that like the way I speak isn't the like the best way. Like I still I stammer a lot, or um, if I'm not prepared and I'm just trying to like come up with questions on the spot, like mm -hmm. you know I just you know I say like a lot and I, you know I'm just not I'm just not well, not super professional or like uh, on the way that I I speak, and so I feel like that deters me from wanting to like be a host of like the content that I make. Um, and so, but yeah, I think, but again, like with everything, like the more practice that I do, the more that I put myself in front or put myself out there on, on trying to be better and work better, the more I get better at it. And the more that I review myself, you know, if I, I started making like the, you know, recording myself on Instagram and, and I pick up, I pick up tips on just how like, okay, obviously it said like a hundred times for this thing. Like, how do I, how do I improve myself on this? I, I wish I, I think I want to get professional training eventually when I have the money for it. But as for now, it's just kind of like, I know I'm not perfect. I'm just going to continue to put myself out there and, and eventually, you know, get better at, 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 at doing this. And so, um, you know, thankfully I've been invited to do more panels, more podcasts, and that's, that's helping me um try to be a little bit more eloquent or more concise but i still have a long ways to go um i remember reaching out to some other uh, science communicator friends and be like how are you so good at this and they're like oh i took acting classes like, oh, okay that makes sense <laughs> i wish i had access to that um so we'll see but at this point it's just kind of like i just need to get over myself and just yeah just put myself out there and eventually the more i do this the more it's going to become second nature and mm -hmm. i won't be so self-deprecating or self-critical of myself and again thank you for being honest and so truthful you know that's that's something that it's hard to recognize those faults in us and else because i myself i say like a lot <laughs> and you know it's something that i also try to improve on and work on improving so thank you and you know i want to i know you're putting in the work and building this strong foundation and it's ever evolving future doctors but as of now, where do you want to see future doctors in the next five years? Like after, like in the next five years, where do you want to see it? And where do you want to see yourself as a science communicator? Because you realize you can do this as a full-time job, but yeah. what are the plans currently in this time frame that you see yourself that it's possible? Yeah, I think, you know, before I wanted future doctors to be like, before I wanted future doctors to be like, okay, so I wanted like, I wanted research companies to pretty much hire me to, to produce videos for them. So then I can showcase the jobs that they have available and also showcase if they do have any diversity 
like initiatives or people um, to kind of be the, you know, represent their brand. So then, um, you know, giving exposure to that company, but also giving that's ex direct exposure to my audience or high school audience. But again, like I think uh, same how I mentioned before, where the biggest critique that I got was like, well, how am I going to make money doing this? I had to do a lot of customer research and to see like, will businesses actually be willing to pay for, you know, pay me, like pay for me to make videos about their work? Mm -hmm. um, is there a way that I can have some type of scholarship or some type of, you know, internship that we can get high school students directly connected to these things mm -hmm. instead of only being just a one direction of just, here's a video, good luck trying to figure out how you can get to this position, you know, but you know, I'm, I have to do a little bit more research or more customer discovery to figure out if that's actually possible. So like my short term goal right now is that I want to, I want to get paid to give workshops on, um, teaching either scientists or students on how to make videos. Mm -hmm. Um, and also, um, hopefully get some funding to, to kind of create my own, to start developing future doctors as like the YouTube channel, start push, pushing more content out there. Cause the more content that I have out there, then the more people are willing to see that, you know, the stuff I do is legit. Um, and so I think I want to, I want to, so my short term goal is just to expand in between schools, do like some type of after school science communication workshop while I'm developing, uh, creating more content for future doctors and maybe get paid to do workshops or be a teacher on how to do science videos so then I can continue to build my capital so then I can eventually, uh, you know, pitch to some investors or just yes. get more money, um, some seed funding so I can do future doctors full time. Yes. And thank you for sharing that because as we were talking in this conversation and being open of what you're going through, what you want, what you envision, and also putting in the work, you find people that support you and can connect with you and i know that you're in that path of making that be you know a reality for yourself and for future doctors and you know i'm excited to see that growth and that success and stephanie this has been an amazing conversation i want to finish this with my last question you know the journey and the story that you shared with us and experience in your life if you had the possibility of going back in time at whatever age and time of your life, you know, what would you say to young Stephanie? Ugh, man, I don't even know. I don't know. <laughs> even yourself. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. I have no idea. I think, I don't know. I feel like I would have just like just reassured myself or like told myself maybe like college or, or early graduate school, just to like trust my, trust my gut. Cause I think that's what I, I mostly done the whole time. Like I, I listened to my intuition or I listened to my gut. And when I knew something didn't feel right, like that was the indicator, like, this is not right. You know, so like, that was the cue for me to like, okay, figure out. So it's just like, you know, to have the, you know, have this, like trust my gut and have the self-confidence to say no and just mm -hmm. stick up for myself. Cause I feel like I learned how to advocate for myself by having to be going through the trauma that I technically went through was how I learned how to advocate for myself. So I just wish I was just a little bit more, um, yeah, give myself a little bit more reassurance that like, you know, what I'm going through is, you know, I'm not crazy. And, um, and yeah, that just to trust my, to trust my gut. Cause I know what I need for myself and I know, I know what's right. Beautiful. Thank you, Stephanie. I love this conversation. I love getting to know you even more, you know, not only reading it on your Instagram and on your website, but really getting to know you here on AES. And, you know, for our listeners who want to follow you, ask you questions, maybe, you know, watch your videos on Future Doctors. Where can they visit? Where can they follow you? Yeah. So it's uh, at Future Doctors. So PH instead of F. So P H U T U R E and then Doctors. Uh, it's the same thing on my Instagram, Facebook. Twitter and my YouTube finally. Um, so yeah, on, even on futuredoctors.com, uh, they can find all, all the links to the people that I've mentioned before and like the, the previous videos that I've made. And so, yeah. Perfect. And thank you, Stephanie. Thank you again for your time and for being open as always. And thank you for listening and watching this conversation. I hope you'll feel motivated, inspired to really advocate for yourself, to believe in yourself and to put in the work put in the work of that, building that strong foundation for your 
project, side business, or entrepreneurship or career. And I know I'll be listening to this on repeat because it was an amazing conversation. And you can follow AS on Instagram at AS the Podcast at AAAS the Podcast. We're also on LinkedIn as AS Podcast, on TikTok as AS the Podcast. You can email me to be a feature guest here at AS the Podcast at gmail.com. That is AAAS the Podcast at gmail.com. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. Seriously, I love this and I hope you loved it as well. And I'll be seeing you in two weeks. Adios. Bye.